Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment. Hello, and welcome to Champions of Psychology, a show with the goal of openly talking about mental health, presented by Codename Entertainment and TakeThis.org. Every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, here on Twitch.tv slash CNE Games, Mitra Jordan, Rafael Bucamazzo, a.k.a. Dr. B, talk about mental health and how gaming affects us. Uh, if you're here live in the chat, you can leave a question that I will ask them later in the show. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking about some parasocial relationships with fictional characters. But before we get to that, who are you two for the fine folks who may not know? Well, I'm uh, Mitra Jordan. I'm a registered clinical counselor working in Victoria, British Columbia. I work with uh, lots of people, um, mainly individuals, sometimes families. I work with youth and otherwise adults, because really, you're either children, youth or adults, aren't you? So <laughs> I can be both. <laughs> 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 yes and and sometimes at the same time he can be all of them at the same time because that's that's how he rolls um so that's me that's me and now i give you over to my compadre of long italian name reasons yes hi i'm giggles mcginty <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm, uh... I'm dr rafael bocamazzo uh, everybody calls me dr b for the aforementioned long italian name reasons uh, and I am a, both a psychologist, a clinical psychologist licensed in Washington State, and I am the clinical director at uh, what was the very first mental health nonprofit to serve the game community, Take This, now in our 10th year. Yeah. Yeah, so excited about that. Um, I'm an expert on applied tabletop RPGs. I'm a consulting psychologist uh, with the uh, YouTube channel How to ADHD. Uh, I am a, a, an editor on the now, now just announced zeitgeist of Discworld yeah. book that is open Ooh. has open calls for chapters want to get into the psychology of Discworld. um yeah i get around. around cool dude i <laughs> oh, please <laughs> i'm definitely not cool uh but uh yeah i we're I'm, I'm around professionally that's what i do and hey hey trevor Yo, mitra what? what show number is this oh god not again. this again oh no what is it <laughs> I don't know, but it's pretty nice. nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we're gonna say on that one. Um, I do, I do uh, really like uh, this. Uh, this is from uh, D Drake, or uh, is it? Yeah, D Drake, uh, two thousand six. Uh, is a perfect example for this episode. Oh my God, it's my real life best friends, Beecher, Raphael, and Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate the slash S. Thank you for that one. But yeah, no, but we're, we're going to be talking about uh, parasocial relationships, mainly with a focus on fictional characters today. Um, but, you know, we I don't think we've actually talked about parasocial relationships on this show. So why don't we start off with what is a parasocial relationship? Yep, yep, yep. And this is uh, this is becoming an area of fascination for me. Um working with streamers and the like, because, uh, yeah, that's a whole different show. But um, parasocial relationships are an old idea. They've been formally researched since the 1950s, and it's an intense, emotional, one-way connection that you have with a media figure due to report just repeated exposure. And it can be uh, a, an actor, a musician, a... Um, a sports figure, or even a fictional character, you've got this just emotional bond with them that's one way, just based on the exposure. And the cool thing is, is that 
there's actually some really there's some really cool upsides to it, especially traditional parasocial relationships that um, are thought of historically as supplementary to existing friendships. Mm -hmm. um, they don't re they typically didn't replace your friendships, but that's why we're talking about this because we have characters we admire, mm -hmm. like I like who we want to be like because of this thing called wishful identification. <laughs> And wishful identification plays a really important role in our development. Mm -hmm. So as as children, for instance, you know, where do we get an idea of who we want to be when we grow up? And that's really through this sense of identification and inspiration, of hero figures, mm -hmm. um, of people, you know, in in books and in movies and um, through our through our kind of uh, consumption of those medias that we know we're drawn to that speak to a part of ourselves and yeah. i you know i definitely might want to be like me when you grow up yeah God. yeah <laughs> it's gonna be one of those shows folks just buckle up that's all i can say all you know b b before the, the show came on we tea. were talking about how all of us rely on artisanal store-bought dopamine and <laughs> <laughs> Got so much store bought dopamine around me. Uh, <laughs> look, I, I got this keyboard. I've got this keyboard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, no. As you were talking there, though, like you know about like how you how you'd want what you'd want to be when you grow up. That immediately made me remember, like when I was a kid, I wanted to be an actor, and that was a thousand percent because of Robin Williams. Like that was mm. my parasocial relationship yes. as a kid was I was obsessed with Robin Williams and because of that I wanted to be an actor like him. Mhm. Mm God, yeah, no, I didn't even think about when yeah. um when I was thinking when we were putting this together, I didn't even think about Robin Williams that yeah. I I think his maybe his is I think the only episode of Inside the Actors Studio that I have the DVD of. Oh. Mm -hmm. Good episode. Now he is a fictional character though, but I well, hear it's you. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, no. We're, that's probably why we didn't talk. That's why we didn't about think of it because I didn't think of like yeah. our actors and yeah. Yeah, and, and, but but like just just kind of in that general thing of like how parasocial relationships at a younger age can kind of shape things. But yeah, when mm -hmm. it but when it comes to, I almost think that like fictional characters for the most part. I don't know if it has. To, I don't know the crossover with career wise or whatnot. But I do think just kind of from my outside perspective, it does seem that that's kind of something that helps you shape your personality, though. Is that like I I idolize this fictional character? I want to be like them. Is that is that sort of how it is? I mean, sure. I you know I've, I've I've made jokes about this many times that I I have two two real heroes that are fictional characters, and one of them arguably only semi so, and both of them have the last name Rogers, Steve and Fred. I I love Captain America, mm -hmm. and I love Mister Rogers, and. You know, I, I I can't deny the influence both of them had on how I am in the world. Um, Captain America, because at least the way they wrote him a lot of times in the comic books, he there was a tension between what the world wanted him to be, and that's to cut corners and not follow the rules and not do the morally right thing, and the consequences of actually doing the right thing and bearing those consequences. And then with Mr. Rogers... Just, you know, wanting to create community, wanting to create a place where everybody feels like they belong and wanting to treat people with kindness. I can't deny the influence of both of those things on my career. Yeah. I mean, his 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 uh, waistcoat does kind of give him a Rogerian, uh, Rogers, <laughs> not Rogerian, but yeah, Rogerian is a very different thing to psych very people. Very thing. <laughs> Although I have to say, not considerably different than Mister Rogers, but that's a whole other topic. Okay, no, I'm, I'm right? with you on that. I am so with you on that. Mm -hmm. The three people who have taken psych class, grad school psych classes in the chat are like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, like the, I mean, we talked about a few of these yesterday. I was just like, you know, you had Captain America and Mr. Rogers, like one of them that po instantly popped in my head was Spider-Man. Like I a hundred percent crack jokes in stressful situations because I was obsessed with Spider-Man as a kid. Uh, cause I, that, that was just who I related to. And like, I watched that animated series every chance I freaking got. Um, and yeah, it, it, it definitely did shape a bit of who I am today but 
Yeah, I think what I like about Spider-Man is he didn't do everything right. And his smart mouth got him into trouble sometimes. And, <laughs> oh, you know, happened. he's just he's just much more relatable. We were talking about this yesterday, how he's so much more relatable than than Superman. Right. Um, so I ran into some problems with this. We talked a little bit about why that was. I found that um, for the characters that I was drawn to, you know, for for my generation, which is a little older than than you guys, um, there really just wasn't, and particularly as a woman of color, there just wasn't that much around mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, I guess, role models in social media that I was really drawn to. I mean, yeah, Princess Leia is kind of a badass, but hello, the bikini scene and the over-sexualization of strong yep. female characters, right. or the watering down of them. You know, you've got... Right. Um, you've got Superman and then you've got Supergirl and she's she's super an after, afterthought is what the problem is. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got Wonder Woman, but she's so impossibly beautiful and perfect. You know, it, it was it was hard often to find um, female characters as a cis woman, female characters who are kind of like um, equally strong in their own right and aren't undercut in some way mm -hmm. or made to be too impossibly perfect so i think this is this really played into you know women's challenges with beauty standards for example um or with their own sense of what it is to be strong you know we've often heard the idea that if if um from a gender perspective the more as a as someone masculine presenting who's like strong and assertive gets rewarded for that Right, but a feminine presenting or feet or a cis woman who's who's kind of strong and assertive, you know, often got labeled as a bitch. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean that you you also bring up uh, a certain cohort effect and also geographical stuff because you yeah. know you growing up in the UK, if we think about how people of color have been represented in colonialist literature. Um, you know the the example that comes to mind uh, a lot of times like Richard Kipling. And some of Rudyard Kipling's work, uh, Gunga Din is not exactly a great, a great three dimensional representation of another human being. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, the three people who have taken lit classes are like, yes, Gunga Din. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but... Yeah, and I used a language there. Sorry, chat. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Wait, but did you? No, it was, I it, did. Well, I said the B word, right? Oh, and so, okay. We're PG. Yeah, yeah, 13. no, no, no. Um, <laughs> the point of that is that, yeah, that was a way to silence women as well, that yeah. kind of language. But to get back on track, but it's, it, no, but it's, it's important to kind of look at some of the yeah. barriers towards yeah. finding those kinds of inspirational figures in Absolutely. one's life. I was thinking it wasn't just who one wanted to be. Mm -hmm. um it was also maybe who one wanted to be with yeah. in terms of parasocial relationships oh. who i'm attracted to or who i think i'd like to uh, marry oh. when i grow up or any mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff you know it's mm. a signpost for what i might be drawn to right yeah huh. <laughs> Do dr b is uh he's having some thought <laughs> where I is giggles no, mcginty just had going a with this? Uh, you yeah. just had a breakthrough <laughs> yeah no no the carrot no <laughs> oh boy Smart, assertive redheads. Uh, <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> my crush yes. on Jean Grey just suddenly makes <laughs> way more sense. Like, which one was it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, capable, brilliant, assertive redheads. Huh. Yeah, yeah. so. Yeah, there's that. And that. A great example of sort of someone out there who gets to, in some ways, buck the stereotype. Although, of course, always gorgeous still, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. No, um, I mean, I I was at when you talk about like this over idealization of certain yeah. things and perfection. I mean, yeah. Jean Grey came to mind as an example of a of like a nearly messianic figure in that yeah. respect. Well, yeah, it, definitely. It, well, I think I think there's you know possibly even more to that because like you you hear people say like oh that's my TV mom, like you know like like yeah. there, there, there's a there's a character like i've heard people say that about like kitty foreman from that 70s show They're like that's my tv mom right kitty. and uh, right i'm just the best uh, <laughs> <laughs> that 90s show needs to come out already um but uh yeah the, I, there, there's 
I, I do think that there is really a bunch of different sort of <laughs> someone said Carrie Fisher is my space mom. Yes, I love Carrie that. Fisher is space yeah. mom. Yes. Yeah. She absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. It, so it, it's, it is interesting for me now thinking about this, just like how many like different types of parasocial relationships people can have with fictional characters throughout their life. Oh, totally. I mean, there, it, it, there's a lot of different versions of this, and Mitra just Mitra just brought up a great one, like the people we want to be with, or the idealized figures we want in our life. I mean, we're talking about Space Mom, we're talking about Kitty Foreman as TV Mom. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people who I think um, maybe then now I'm really getting into Mitra's territory of attachment psychology. <laughs> um, you know, who maybe lack attachment figures and have idealized versions in characters and shows that they would like to see or maybe that's the person they want to be like when they become a caregiver yeah now absolutely. that i've exhausted my knowledge on that mitra <laughs> ah but it's so it's so true like a lot of the reparative work that clients do in therapy with me is perhaps many other therapists do it that came up but anyway back on track bloody adhd so okay <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the reparative work that people do has to do with making sense of the grief they feel around the parents that they've had versus the parents that were wished for <laughs> versus the love that they wish was held for them, right? And, and I think having examples to reach out for, it's a bit like this, or it's a bit of that Carrie Fisher energy, or it's a bit of, you know, um, it just helps us connect with something that was missing. Sure, it brings up grief, but we need to know what's missing in order to bring it into our lives, whether it's within ourselves or within other relationships that we form or the person who we want to be with and the kind of parent we hope that they'll be. So a lot of healing work happens looking at this kind of material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, drawing on the what's out there. We would all be lucky to have Carrie Fisher energy in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh, I I just keep thinking about what she said on that one interview. Uh, no matter how I no matter how I leave this world, uh, make sure my obituary reads being drowned in the moonlight, strangled by my own bra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's you know it's it, it's interesting that throughout all of this is a throughout all of this is a thread of idealization, mm -hmm. like and learn and even a future oriented thinking of. What do I want my life to be like? What do I want attachment figures in my life to be like? What do I want relationships in my life to be like? Yeah. And an idealization of certain characters as sort of prototypical examples of exactly that. I mean, now that I think about, boy, I'm having a lot of personal breakthroughs here. Um, <laughs> gee, why did I, you know, geeky, scrawny kid who was kind of clumsy and ostracized. Why in the world did I identify with Cyclops? Hmm. <laughs> uh Gosh. Okay. Um... <laughs> well, okay. So one of the things we have in our notes, though, that that is kind of something that like Mitra was talking about. What does like how do these parasocial relationships with fictional characters influence our worldview? Like, is it just that it is the ideal ideal uh, version of what we think it is, or is there something more to it? That's a very good question. I think. Yeah, which that... one of us came up with that? <laughs> <laughs> Probably Trevor. Probably. <laughs> what? Oh, I can't blame me for things. <laughs> well, it, I think you know. I. <laughs> one of my earbuds. I don't know any. I don't know the direct research on this, but when I think about when I think about um, other research on things like player motivations in games, it depends on the person. Like. When when I do work with people regarding tabletop RPGs and their characters, there is a level of connection there. But in some cases, it's a fantasy wish fulfillment. In some cases, it's a it's catharsis of sorts, not in the classic Freudian sense of the term, but um, it, it's essentially an emotional release. Like, I, you know, watching John Wick. No one does that. I'm never going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But oh, it's. On a, on some nights, it's just really cool to be like, okay, okay, you have a problem, boom, 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 boom. Ah, Keanu Reeves. <laughs> but it, it's, it, yeah, there's all sorts of different reasons people may become attached to, to people, um, whether it's a cathartic 
whether it's a cathartic experience, it's a fantasy experience, whether it's an idealization experience, whether it is a, re and some people, it's a reflection of the current experiences. Mm. That's me on the screen. Mm. Okay. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Huh, uh, yeah, the well. Current experiences. I, yeah, okay. What so, you're ex um, I'm, I'm going to speak to this only from my own personal perspective, because I really don't want to speak on behalf of others. Um, is that, you know, there are experiences that and identities that are not represented well on mm. on screen. And I've talked I've talked about this in previous episodes when it comes to autistic representations mm. in media. They're generally speaking, not good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. um, if you think about it, they either have some sort of functional exceptionalism, like they're the best in their field at something. If you think about Bones, uh, the TV show Bones. Uh, Temperance Brennan was so autistic. Uh, <laughs> they never fully said it, but she's so autistic. Uh, but she's the best in the world at what she does. Uh, the Good Doctor, a savant. Mm -hmm. Rain Man, savant. Data on Star Trek, savant. Um, there is exceptionalism combined with a disability. And it's really rare that I see a character that's whose struggles are accurately represented when it comes to autism. And the only time I think I've ever really done that, and I'm really angry about what franchise it is, was Newt Scamander yeah. Oh, yeah. on Fantastic Beasts because they didn't make a big deal about the fact that he was different. Um, oh, Yellow Straw, I have so many beefs with the Big Bang Theory. That is... Oh, God, yeah. I have no. so many beefs with that. <laughs> yeah. Um the um because we're we're not laughing with them we're laughing at them i was and... just thinking that yeah and i hate that i hate yeah. that i just feel small and mean afterwards yeah if i'm laughing yeah i've Honestly, had those experiences were... and yeah. been the one targeted um but yeah the um newt scamander he doesn't make eye contact he has a really super interest um he's not a traditional hero but in the end he's not he's not classically you know like cary grant or or george clooney or brad pitt good looking but he's a romantic lead who gets to be a hero and mm -hmm. they don't make a big deal about the fact that he's different and not making eye contact. They mention it once or twice and you just don't see that. Mm -hmm. And I cried openly the first time mm -hmm. I watched that. I was on a plane because that's me. That's my life. Feeling different in a world that is not built for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. it just resonated so hard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I hate that we're picking, we, we end up having to either look at a franchise that in other ways we can't be comfortable about at all and we're furious at, frankly, um, or it feels like we're scrabbling through the dust, finding the crumbs, mm -hmm. you know, finding oh, a bit of this or a bit of that, you know. Um, it's really disappointing that that happens um, and I'm I'm glad that we're moving towards at least a time where I'm hoping there'll be just continually more representation, better and more, not less one dimensional or two dimensional representation, right? But um, oh, and yeah. not in super problematic franchises that I yeah I, yeah I yeah. I, I <clears throat> like I want to tell people it's good representation of one thing, but then you have to spend money and support the coffers of turfy mcwizardly but um yeah it's and, and not to mention i'm really not super impressed with the way um with the way color was handled and race was handled in that franchise <laughs> yeah that's a whole different set of yeah. dimensions yeah. so to we're not yeah, yeah exactly but once again i feel that something i could have been drawn to ends up alienating parts of me right and i think that's one of the challenges with kind of finding um inspiration like um i remember as a kid gandalf was one of my favorite characters yeah. and i wanted to be just like gandalf i couldn't see myself being like arwen i could not see myself in any way being like galadriel like where are the strong female characters right and that's okay that was that that's for its time and and tolkien will forever remain you know a, a deeply important part of my uh, my own process and journey and my own creative loves. And I was so, in, I've always 
absolutely adored The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. But in there, you know, aside from Bilbo wanting his kettle now and again, where I could personally really relate to, <laughs> hello, I drink a lot of tea. <laughs> I like my Are comforts. We... <laughs> I like my blankets and I like my well-stocked larders, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Do we uh, all but... start to admire hobbits as we oh, age? Oh, man. I'm going <laughs> to so be honest. Much. Like, from a young age, like, they showed hobbits, and I'm just like, I, I, I could get down here. The, the, this is, I could live here. <laughs> just curl up with a blanket, watch a river for a few days. Oh, it sounds great. <laughs> I absolutely love Gandalf's understated sarcasm and um, just the way... I think Gandalf like of a holding of space for other characters, yeah. but but also holding them accountable. Fool of a took, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Right. And um and just kind of take no prisoners, you know, kind of approach to things. Yeah, that that speaks to me. So. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting now that I'm hearing about like as we were talking about this, hearing who your different parasocial bonds were with in terms of fictional characters and then there's part of me going yep that makes sense that makes sense this is why i don't want to cross mitra because i know that she's got the hidden power in there and she's going to take down the balrog and that balrog will be me and <laughs> I... no. you're never the balrog <laughs> if i ever made you angry i would be <laughs> You're just going to say to Trevor, fly, you fool. And then <laughs> down I go. Oh, God. I am wearing gray. What, what more do you need to know? And as soon as as soon as soon Mitra defeats me, she will be Mitra the White. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it's going to take? Oh, that's yeah, no, awful. Mitra the Gray will become Mitra the White, and she'll come riding into the next show on Shadow Fang, and I will be absent. Actually, no, I'll be in the dungeon oh, back there. Oh, and... oh she... she uh... She's got them actually in there. <laughs> Tell you what, let, let's take a quick break to remind our, our viewers of our disclaimer. And then we'll be back to talk a little bit more uh, about this topic and answer your questions. So we will be right back. Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment. Hello, we're back. If either of them mentioned cooking with Trevor, tell them it's a bad idea. Uh, no, we love it. I didn't have to. I did not have to because you just did the work for us. It's a glorious thing. Um, okay. <laughs> I wanted to get the last part of this, uh, of the notes that we had in there uh, talked about before going into the questions, um, which is when is it too much? Because, you know, mm. parasocial relationships, it, what we've been talking about has been good, but mm -hmm. we do know that there is very negative effects of parasocial relationships as well. So what is what is too much in this situation? Well, if we're talking about parasocial relationships with fictional characters, um there is there is always the possibility of just not living enough in the actual real world mm. and and that actually goes for any form of parasocial relationship we want them to be a source of inspiration a bridge to your own resources um and to your your own kind of taking what you need from it and moving forward um unfortunately yeah i think that it can be a coping tool too it can be a place you go to hide, a comforting place, rather than finding um, or having the resources to move forward in your own life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that I think the way we talked about it yesterday was, you know, tr the traditional research on one sided parasocial relationships thinks of them as supplementary ad in addition to. And when you know, in addition to 
IRL friendships. You know, my admiration of Captain America, my admiration of Mr. Rogers guides me in how I conduct myself in the real world. Mm -hmm. But if it becomes a replacement, when it becomes avoidance, like Mitra said, then that's, you know, any, anything that's long-term avoidance, that's just a general red flag for me and probably a lot of other yeah. mental health professionals out there. Yeah. Um, but anything that becomes a replacement is, is, you know, worth exploring when people, when people ever come to my office and they're like, I'm doing this thing instead of this thing. I'm like, well, okay, let's talk about that. So instead of it being supplementary and additional to, if it becomes a replacement and avoidance, that's, that's my shorthand for when I'd be chatting with somebody about these things, or if there's a break in reality, mm -hmm. because there yeah. are people who are vulnerable to that. Um, and I'm, I want to, I want to treat with the, treat this with the reverence it deserves. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm really not going to make any jokes about this because there are people who are, who have a hard time distinguishing, you know, characters people play from the people themselves. And that in and of itself is a, a big red flag. Um, Absolutely. When, when working with this stuff. Yeah. Because then you can, I mean, the problem is if we elevate something, mm -hmm. um, we have just as much the capacity to kind of see it crumble and feel yeah. a loss, a personal loss there, yeah. right? So if somebody is, you know, say a real world figure, it's even worse, of course, if it's a real world figure, but say somebody we admire then has, you know, feet of clay, as they say, and goes and does something that is um, awful or misjudgment yeah. or racism or has an affair, whatever it is, right, that they do. And we can turn on them, right? Because mm -hmm. we've made them superhuman in some way. Right. And and this is true of our fictional characters as well, right? We can be very taken by a certain fandom. We can be very engaged with a particular character. We can feel very inspired. And then the writers of the show um, or of the book do something. And we're like, nah, I just didn't see that coming. Or I don't believe that person's capable of that. Or I believe that's poorly written or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it can feel like a very personal loss. Yes. And there are enough losses in the world without fictional ones also becoming mm -hmm. personal losses, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, how many people on the internet have have we seen? And this is be, we've seen this so many times. It's almost become a cliche joke. You know, you ruined my childhood. Oh, and yeah. we're yeah, you know yeah. you know who 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 is the latest Star Wars writer to ruin a childhood? I mean, it's. Because we we make we can make these parasocial bonds so central to our lives, like Mitra said, that it becomes a personal affront or a personal betrayal um, when thing they and somehow act against our expectations, even though we have no idea who's you know we have no control over who's writing what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see this quite often with the idea of the canon. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When when there's a story that is perhaps a book, perhaps a graphic novel, and then it's turned into a different form. You know, mm -hmm. it's either turned into a video game, say, mm -hmm. or it's turned into a film when it was a book first, and it just doesn't feel like we can connect in the same way. And, and that can create a lot of uh, unhappiness, a lot of anger, actually, a lot of aggressive feelings. Oh, totally. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, you know what? I, I actually experienced some of this about, oh, I, I think it was about 10 years ago. Um, because the, you know, the, the Marvel, Marvel, the comics was just absolutely floundering in terms of print comics and so forth. And they were trying to figure out what to do with the franchise. And so they were, they were really thrown out some pretty wild ideas um and i think it was i think the the two that just sent me over the edge as a complete betrayal of the character concepts were captain america working for red skull mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and also magneto working for red skull mm -hmm. and i'm like you yeah. you take the two most anti-nazi characters in all of marvel and have them working for red skull at you know Magneto as a Romani? Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And right. I was, yeah. I was angry about that. I took, in retrospect, I took that way more personally than I probably should have. Yeah, well, you know, and I felt that way about the Hobbit movie, movies. 
what business <laughs> did they have being that many of them anyway? Um, you know, and it was really disappointing because, of course, I thought, I mean, I, of course, I thought The Lord of the Rings was generally very, very good, except I won't quite forgive them for what they did to Eowyn and Faramir. But, you know, that aside, um, you know, because Eowyn was one of my favorite characters, actually. Yeah. One of my a favorite lot of people, female characters. A lot characters. of people I know love Eowyn. For mm-hmm. a lot of good reasons. Yeah. You know, she's more or less neglected by her father in some ways, but she shines anyway. Mm -hmm. She's a strong character. She Mm -hmm. wants to go out there and defend and represent. Mm -hmm. And and Faramir is is, is also neglected by his father. He's underestimated. He's undermined. And he's amazing, right? And then how that was handled was just, oh, come on, Jackson, come on. But anyway... That just fails in comparison. You see what I mean? This is what happens. Okay, but hold on. This is the same guy who made Meet the Feebles. I'm just throwing that out there. (laughs) And if any, again, the three people who have seen that movie know what's up, all right? I have no idea. If you ever watch Peter Jackson's early work, you're going to wonder why they gave him money. (laughs) Ah, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. But, well, Oh, go, go. No, go, go. Well, what what I was gonna say is just like so, like there is obviously a lot. Of, like we have uh, strong opinions about the things that we really like, especially when uh, you know if we do grow one of these parasocial bonds with one of those characters. But we do see that like there is this taken to the extreme where people are just like you know online just throwing you know a, a dumpster fire essentially of just like mm-hmm. uh, you know uh opinions and hot takes and everything out there and like i i guess for my perspective is weird because like m- there's been so many times when stuff that i have really liked has gone in a way that i don't enjoy and i've gone that sucks and i'm like and then i just don't do anything with it anymore i i get i guess it comes down to that like like the the uh the airport thing like i'm not announcing my departure (laughs) Um, um, and uh it's so it's it it is interesting to me that like i I do wonder if like the parasocial relationship part of it does have something to do with the extreme you know emotions that we see expressed online when something changes in that canon uh, that that you know, Mitra is talking about. It was funny though. You, you you were talking about like if a book was made into a video game, and I was like, when's the last time a book got made into a video game? Dante's Inferno. Yep, and that one did not go with canon either. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> no, but that was a, that was a fascinating video game. So weird. It's true. <laughs> but it was uh, real weird. But so fascinating. <laughs> Um, okay, is there any last things that we want to say about this before hopping over to yeah. some uh, uh, viewer questions? Yeah, I think, again, it comes down to attachment. Mm-hmm. Like, why do we attach to things? We we attach to, obviously, we attach to people in our lives because that's where our safety comes from. Um, that's where our sense of connection comes from. But I think we also attach to, to uh, fictional characters or to these kinds of um, or even fictional worlds, because there is something there that connects us with ourselves. We co- we connect with something and we connect with parts of ourselves that may not be getting expression anywhere else, for example, right? Or may also just attach to some inspirational sense of a direction we want to go in or a person we want to be with, as we were saying before. So when our attachments are tampered with, Yes, we get mad. Like, I'm not saying that it's a healthy response when it comes to fictional stuff. It's because we need, obviously, we need enough supports and resources in our life that if one thing goes wrong, we can cope well with it. Okay, yeah, I'm not announcing my departure, as you said, right? But understanding the why of it can be helpful, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and in in a similar vein, as you know, as we grow, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to say that this idealization uh, of things is childish, but it can definitely be childlike. Yeah, yeah, and it can be simplistic, and I think it's it's a much more difficult cognitive experience and emotional experience to be able to say, you know what this character was important to me or remains important to me because of X, Y, Z in my past. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what happens with that character, that doesn't take that away. The importance does not take it away from me. And being able to have that, have that admiration with distance Mm -hmm. 
is a tough tightrope to walk, but yeah. also a really valuable one. Absolutely. One example that popped in my head just as you're talking there, though, is like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I love Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as a kid. That was one of my favorite properties <sighs> ever. And like I loved Michelangelo, Donatello, and all and all them. And but like now they're completely different. But the thing is though, is that like I'm not upset about them, like because I had my parasocial relationship with them when I was a kid. Some mm -hmm. kid now is gonna have that same parasocial relationship with these new characters that just happen to have the same name. And I'm excited for that kid. I don't mm -hmm. I don't I, I've already yeah. got what I needed out of that. I'm excited yeah. for that kid that mm -hmm. that that's gonna mm -hmm. mean something too. I may not have been gotten into the Clone Wars that much, but so many of the kids that I part of part of it's just time. I don't have time yeah. to watch all of it. Flash but the the kids I work with, they talk about the Clone Wars like I do Empire. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's let, let's hop over and check it with chat real quick. Uh, let's see. We're gonna start with. Um, oh, I apologize now if I pronounce this wrong. Elfaba. I'm going to go with Alfaba85. Uh, can you have a parasocial relationship with your D&D &D character or uh, uh, or because you play that character, is it something different? I'm going to say it's something different because I think when we play a character, we have a different relationship with making changes, making connections, being that character. We mm -hmm. make choices. Um, with a parasocial relationship, it's like another person in the sense that we don't control them. Uh, we don't um, figure out who they are or ought to be. We just engage with them. I mean, you mm. might want them to be something they're not, or we might um, project onto them, but because they're not, we're not playing them or making them right. us or making them up as we go along. It's not the same. Yeah, I, I I'm glad Mitra started with that because my goodness, that's a that's an interesting question with a lot of really fascinating mm -hmm. overlaps. But yeah, I think you nailed it on the head, Mitra. The the idea that there is a two way agency involved in this makes mm -hmm. it something else. It still can be a deep bond that we have, and certainly actors talk about this. You mm -hmm. know, getting into the headspace or the emotional feels of a certain character and. Um, parting with them when a series or a movie ends and there's almost a grief process and parting with that character for some actors. Um, but yeah, I think that 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 agency and ownership creates a different dynamic than that one way parasocial relationship. Uh, one of the mods pointed out that it's Alphaba from uh, Wicked, and I just didn't notice that because I'd never read the book and I've only seen the play. Apologies. Uh <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, let's go to Lurking Writer. He says, question. Uh, stories are how we learn to be human. Uh, fictional characters can often be how we learn to recognize aspects of our own personalities. Speaking of parasocial yeah. aspects, how can we identify what the boundaries are between this being a healthy thing for us and taking it too far? Or is that uh, something that needs to be assessed uh, on an individual basis? I mean everything needs to be assessed on an individual basis that is I mean, true um but we, i think we covered we covered some of the red flags that we would look yeah. for in a clinical setting like if i look if avoidance and avoidance and replacement and even a blend a, a lack of being able to differentiate reality mm-hmm uh, okay, then uh, I'm actually going to skip uh, Reaver One's question as well because it's very similar. But I I, I hope that uh, that answer was what you were looking for. Uh, let's see. Let's go to uh, uh, Voxtum. Uh, question: We tend to focus on heroes in regard to parasocial identification, but what about um uh oh what about appreciation for villains? Uh, I'm a big fan of Doctor Octopus. Should I be worried? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you should be worried. I think that you have their, you know, I think the thing with villains is you have to have a villain that can stand up to a hero, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have someone fairly powerful and also flawed. Uh, you know, a good story isn't a good story if we can't in some ways identify with the villain, right? Mm -hmm. And and certainly for me, sometimes I'll look at a good villain and go, yeah, I kind of see what happened to you or I kind of see where you went wrong, right? I mean, if a villain is just flat out evil, they're very two dimensional. Well, they're actually quite one dimensional. They're mm -hmm. actually kind of, you know, and and I don't. There's no there's no finding anything to hold on to or to connect with. So no, I think that 
uh, we absolutely can identify with villain characters. Yeah. You um, know, a good... Oh, no, please. Sorry. Had I was it. done. I was going to ramble. Seems worth cutting me off. Keep going. <laughs> no, the... Uh... The, I, I forget where I read this, but it's a quote that stuck with me that good villains think they're right. The best villains make you think they're right. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. excellent. B, B Dave yeah. talks about that a lot. Yep. That's, I mean, that's part of the reason I think Killmonger is still maybe oh, yeah. the best villain that Marvel has ever had. Um, hmm. Thanos is up there because he, yeah, but good villains make you think that, yeah, they got something right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I think we're we're. I mean, certainly there's a part of me that's always drawn to the subversive in some way, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, what if you're standing in line at the supermarket checkout and someone says, "How are you today?" and you say something like, "Well, actually, I feel like crap, and I'm going to take this bottle of ketchup home and I'm going to pour it all over my husband's head or something, right?" <laughs> I have never done that and I never will. All I'm trying to say here is that coming up with something bizarre and subversive is kind of compelling sometimes, right? And and villains do the bizarre and subversive. They mm. do the unthinkable. Mm. Mm -hmm. And often in terms of understanding where we fit in a moral society or in a society where we have morals, let's say, not everyone, but <laughs> we, you guys, you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's there is something about understanding the boundaries of that yeah mm -hmm. understanding what would transgress those boundaries yeah how do we not cross those boundaries if we don't have an understanding of transgression if villains do the mm -hmm. unthinkable do the transgressive do the subversive there's something about getting to see that play out that's entertaining why are horror movies interesting to us why are movies where there's content like um i'm thinking of an old one called damage where somebody has an affair with their son's fiance right that's super transgressive that's breaking a lot of the rules mm -hmm. we are curious innately about what happens when rules are broken mm -hmm. where will the consequences take the character how moral is the world that's created these are fascinating uh, experiences to have when we're engaging with our content mm -hmm. so or our heads like me anyway you know <laughs> well and i mean that that you're getting into the idea that art has always been a way of exploring the transgressive and um and we, and we've talked about this in the show in the past of being able to play with rules in a safe framework like i can't i can't go around hurling fireballs irl um but you know it, you better believe that in some of my D and D games, fireballs are the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. <laughs> um. Okay, we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna do one more here before we gotta gotta get out of here. This is from uh, Rat with Wings. Uh, question. Uh, this discussion is reminding me of a set of interviews that uses parasocial relationships with fictional characters as a way to recover from trauma. Are any of you familiar? Oh, uh, are you familiar with uh, Janina uh, Scarlet's superhero theory? And if so, what do you think of it? I'm just like I've had I've had her on a, on one of my podcasts. <laughs> I I it it feels weird to say about somebody I whose phone number I have, but I <laughs> I, I kind of have a parasocial relationship with Janina because I admire I admire her work so much. Oh, yeah. and just um she is an absolute sweetheart of a person mm -hmm. in real life. There are just certain, you know, we've we've joked about don't meet your heroes, but there's been a couple of times where um, I've met people whose professional work I admire, and they are absolutely the people I expected them to be. Janina, Doctor Janina Scarlet, is one of those people. <laughs> yeah, uh, we we had her on writing about dragons and stuff, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, we I mean we actually pretty much talked about this uh, on on that episode of uh, I mean like like she she immediately jumped in it was just like okay what's a character that means a lot to you Trevor and I was just like oh crap Luke Skywalker means a lot to me I did not realize this um, <laughs> so yeah no definitely definitely check out her stuff um, uh, it's fantastic work mm -hmm. um, but yeah. I think I have it on my shelf of like ner my whole nerdy psych library over here. I think a couple of Janina's books because she writes like one a week is like is up there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, all right. Well, I uh, I do think that that is uh, all the time that we've got for for this week's episode. Friends, if people want to find you on the interwebs, where could they do so? I am to be found either at MitraJordan.com or at MitraJordan on Twitter. And those is the two places. But giggles, McGinty face. No. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Uh, you can Eagles. find me at <laughs> pretty much on all the socials at the Doctor B T H E E D O C T O R um, B as in boy. But the more important to account, if, uh, more important account to follow is take this org on all the socials. You can stay up to date on all the stuff we're doing, and we've got some cool stuff uh, coming out in Doctor Giggles. Wow, that is my super villain identity right there. <laughs> <laughs> We got it. <laughs> I'll just be in the background going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And on that note, awesome. you can follow me on Twitter <laughs> at the Trevor. There's an A hiding in there. Uh, we have a very odd schedule this week for uh, for Twitch streaming um, because uh, we have Extra Life happening at the end Ooh. of the week. And we have a lot of travel happening uh, during that time. So be sure to check out our uh, our Twitter page, our the Discord, and our Reddit. Uh, also, we have a, uh, I, I believe we do, we either have a schedule up for or extra life or it is being worked on as we speak uh but you'll be able to see uh all of the shows that we're going to have for our 24 hours of streaming starting at 9 a.m on friday that's pacific standard time here on twitch.tv slash cne games so uh we hope you're able to uh come enjoy that and you know if you're able to donate we're gonna have a lot of fun things that happen on these shows if you donate <laughs> um so be sure to uh check that out but uh that is gonna do it for this week's episode so until next week take care of yourself Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment. <laughs>